If you want Colts talk all year long, you're in the right place. Fires it upfield, caught over the middle, Michael Pittman Jr., there he goes! He's at the 40, he's at the 30, slips out of a tackle, 20, 10, 5, touchdown! Michael Pittman Jr. takes it 75 yards to the house! Big run, angling left, 40, he's at the 30, down the near sideline, 20, 50, 10, 5, touchdown! Jonathan Taylor, a 49-yard! In the Indiana Union Construction Industry Radio Studio, let's get the podcast started. You heard it right there, the official Colts podcast. My name is Jeffrey Gorman, Matt Taylor, J.J. Stankovitz uh, from Colts.com, Matt Taylor, voice of the Colts. Guys, um, I have a question before we go over the draft hall of Chris Ballard. When it comes to mock drafts, J.J., we follow you online. We follow you on Colts.com and everything, and you give a weekly thing of what these experts mm-hmm. think about mock drafts. And I eat it up. I don't know about you guys, but I eat those up in the offseason. And then the draft comes out, and then you kind of compare a little bit. And then there's the draft grades. What are we doing is my With question to you grades? both. What are we doing? I mean, unless yeah. you're – Drafting, hey, is it just on a positional need or are they adding depth or what they think? I know it's one man or one woman's opinion, but shouldn't we do this three years after the draft? Like after this draft, yeah, we'll go, we go, hey, be talking about let's, pay and diet yeah, and let's right. grade right that right. draft. Yeah. Like, I'm serious. Let's talk about Michael you, you can anybody do that? You can, you can grade, I think you can grade process with this. Like, what, what's your process? Like, like mindset? What do you Yeah. Thinking? Like, are, are, you, are you trading up? For guys, are you trading back and accumulating more picks like we saw the Colts do again? Um, are you, quote-unquote, reaching for someone? But even then, like, once you get out of the first eight picks, seven, maybe seven picks this year, uh, you're, like, wh- what's a reach? Right. Like, it, if you have a guy high on your board, who cares if, you know, CBS Sports has him 22nd and you take him 18th? That's not a reach. Yeah. Like, you know, and I, I'm, I had some friends text me specifically about our third round pick, Matt Gonzalez, who like, well, Dane Brugler had him as a fifth round pick. Why do you take him in the third? Because once you get past your top 40 players, mm-hmm. everyone's board is going to be all over the place. That's how you have a guy who could have a, a fourth round grade falling to the seventh. I remember like when I, when I was in Chicago, this happened where they drafted a wide receiver. Uh, it was Calvin Ridley's brother, Riley. And he was like, oh, he had a second round grade by a bunch of people. And he followed out of the, all the way to the fourth round. He didn't really amount to anything. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, Bears got a steal in the fourth round. Like this happens where <laughs> and, everyone's and vice versa yeah, and vice versa. The right. Way. And yeah. everyone's draft board is all over the place. But you're, I mean, you're right. Like yeah. we should be looking back at the 2022, 2021 sure. classes, I, but I still eat it up. I don't know about you guys, but I'm like, it's what like, they give us, you it's know, like Puka Nakua. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Right. 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 Just because Matt Gonzalez was a projected fifth round pick doesn't mean the Colts really covet the way that he plays sure. or the way that he can factor into the, the future of this offensive line with his position flexibility and his height and his speed and things like that and the way that he tests. So, um, yeah, I think it's about process. I think it's about roster construction, too, when you talk about draft grades. This team gets an A. This team gets a D. Well, it, you know, you, you look at what the Falcons did, obviously, in the top of the draft with Michael Penix Jr., and that's a little head-scratching because you already have a quarterback. So I think that kind of factors into these grades and the way that, that people try to assess the draft immediately after. It's like, what do you have now versus what you brought in, and what are, you, what are going to be your needs two, three years down the road? Well, right. I, remember, I remember reading draft grades in 2020 when the Packers drafted Jordan Love. Mm-hmm. It was like, what a stupid pick. They, they need a wide receiver. Yeah. Turns out Aaron Rodgers went out one back-to-back MVPs. Then they flipped to Jordan Love, and all of a sudden they still have the best quarterback in the division. Right, right. It's incredible. And a playoff playoff team. team. How about that? Hey, that's uh, J.J. Stankovitz. Again, Matt Taylor, voice of the Colts. These guys were all over the draft. And coming up, we're going to hear from Ikaika Malloy, who is the UCLA defensive coordinator and Leatu Latu's position coach at Washington and UCLA, which I can't wait to get at. But let's talk about the player first here. Um, I'll start with you, JJ. What sort of production does this guy come in the first year? And also, Matt, I want you to touch on something about um, as far as 
who takes a spell or, you know what I'm saying? Like who's odd man out in that room when it comes to it. But JJ, overall, uh, we talked about mock drafts earlier. I don't know that I saw one person out there. There may have been one that had him falling to where the Colts were picking and grabbing Latu. They, so there were five mock drafts we had mm -hmm. out of 130 something that had the Colts drafting Latu Latu. Wow. Okay. Uh, so shout out to those five. Uh, the most recent was Tom Fernelli with CBS sports. Shout out to Tom, big white Sox fan. Sorry. Uh, and, but so <laughs> I, I, the, the expectation I want to set for Latu is he's a very polished pass rusher. He's coming in with all, he's 23 and a half sacks over the last two years. He dominated the competition. His pass rush win rate in college was like over 25%. So essentially one in every four snaps, he was just beating the guy in front of him. That's really high. But last year, you look at the, f the first edge rusher who came off the board, was Will Anderson Jr., similar in that he was a polished guy coming out of Alabama. Mm -hmm. He had seven sacks, and he had a good year. He won Defensive Rookie of the Year. I think you're looking at if, if Latu's in that range of six to eight, nine sacks, mm -hmm. but he's getting pressure. He's getting consistent pressure. That is a really good rookie season. There have only been eight rookies since 2010 to have double-digit sacks in their first year in the NFL. So that's pretty rare for someone to come out like a Micah Parsons right, right. and have the kind of impact yeah. that he had. If he, if he has a Will Anderson-level season in year one, that is a home run that you just hit in the first round. And I think as far as it translates, Jeffrey, in terms of playing time, I, I think the Colts believe that this could be – and I know there's high expectations upon a rookie and a first-year player, and I get that. But stepping into the mindset of this pick and, and why the Colts you know, pulled this trigger is that I think they believe – that this is the missing piece to their pass rush. Mm. You know, the, the pass rush the last two years has been really good, specifically last year with the 51 sacks and setting a, a franchise record and things like that. But you're top five in overall sacks. But I don't have the number in front of me. Perhaps you can help me out fill, the, fill in the, the gaps here. But I think the Colts last year, they were really good in the sack number total. But I think they were down in the 20s in terms of overall pressure rate. Correct. So they can get better. They can improve in that. And that's all situational. Again, I, it, it goes back to what we talked about last week. I mean, Jeffrey, there was that, that, that Week 18 game, that winning your in game against the Houston Texans, and C.J. Stroud was sacked twice, only hit three times. He had a lot of time last year to use that precise you know, accuracy and just had a really good game against the Colts. That's what they're trying to fix with this pick. They think that, you know, Liatu Latu can be that guy eventually mm – -hmm hopefully by the middle of, the, of next season or certainly towards the end of next season, that in high leverage situations, crunch time, fourth quarter, when you got to get pressure on the quarterback, that he's the guy that can, to J.J.'s point, just win. Beat the guy across from him with his you know, sophistication. He's got a variety of pass rush moves already, a very refined player. They think this guy can be that guy, like a Bosa or a T.J. Watt, that you, you know he's the best right. player on the other team's you know, front seven he's still going to win in high-leverage situations. That's what the Colts are hoping for within this pick. He plays yeah, with and, a reckless and, abandon, and, and I want to ask you about this. Did you find something out about this guy by talking to Ikai, Ikai Kamaloy, who is his defensive coordinator, that you didn't know before you sat down with him? We're going to get to that in a second. Well, r real quick, just to back up Mate's point on the sacks last year, Colts are fourth in the NFL in sacks. They were 27th in total pressures and 28th in pressure rate. There you go. So you're hitting home. That's great. Right. But, you know, it's sort of like you're, you're kind of like – Those big moments, where are you? You're kind of having like a like a Mark Trumbo-like right. season. I, why did <laughs> – Mark At, Trumbo. An Adam Dunn type season. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you. An Adam <laughs> yeah. Dunn type season. Yeah. A lot All of home runs, not a lot of singles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the big donkey. Boy, you're trying I'm, to avoid the big donkey we are season. We are moving on to baseball here. Yikes. Okay. <laughs> Get me out of that mode. Uh, anyways, what we learned about um, Leatu from that chat we had with Ikaika Malloy – He's such a like a kid who is so self motivated. He doesn't need anyone to tell him what he needs to do, and I think that plays so well uh, within an NFL locker room. And I made this point in the the ten Colts things I did wrapping up the NFL draft that you're dropping him into a defensive line room that's led by DeForest Buckner, a guy who has not missed a game due to injury since his rookie year. Guys here, you know, like he's he's the leader yeah. of the breakfast club, they call him, where he's in, he's in at 6 a.m. He's the first guy in the building to lift. And then the other leader in that room is Taekwon Lewis, a guy who, similar-ish to Leatu Latu, has over, had to overcome some significant adversity, injury-related yeah. in his career. I mean, Taekwon Lewis is a guy 
blew out both his kneecaps sure, sure. in consecutive years, almost a year apart to the day, and came back and had an outstanding season in 2023. Like that perseverance aspect of it, I think Latu fits in really well. He's a guy who, and he's also, by the way, he's been training with Quiddy Pay this offseason with, with his defensive line kind of personal coach. Perfect. So Let's go. He's already got a feel for what the room is like. Well, and yeah. it's, I think, yeah. just overall, you're looking at a guy who's a really good fit there. Well, you know me in analogies. I like to dumb it down for the comment. Sure. Man. Like, I think his story is so unique in that, to JJ's point, football was taken away from him for two years in that the Washington doctors and trainers, they wouldn't medically clear him, even though he said, I feel fine, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not in pain, I still feel like I can play. So credit to him for just the relentless, relentlessness to take it upon himself to get himself back to football by you know, seeking out other doctors and a second opinions. Mm -hmm. And you know, Coach Malloy had a huge hand in that. But you know, I, my, one of my favorite things, I love football, right? But I was never a high-level player like Liatu Latu. Uh, you know, in, in, in Power 5 Division One football. But one of my favorite things in life is music. Mm -hmm. S try someone telling you that you can't listen to your favorite songs right. or any music right, at all right, right. for two years. And then you come back, and all of a sudden somebody gives you a brand-new iPod mm -hmm. or a phone full of your favorite classics. I, I wouldn't stop listening to music for five years after. Right, right. right? And I think that's what this is with Latu and his love for football and how – he is not taking anything for granted now and is going to take this opportunity and maximize it to its fullest. Good analogy. I'll take that. I like that. You threw it on music. Is that better than Mark Trumbo? <laughs> yeah, a little bit better than the Trumbo thing. But, hey, we're gonna, you're going to love this player on the field. You're going to love this player off the field, and that's the number one pick, Leatu Latu. And these two caught up recently with his UCLA defensive coordinator, his Washington defensive coordinator, Correct, yeah. and, and a guy who's got a big influence on his life. Here's an interview with uh, Ikaika Malloy that we're going to find out even more about Leatu after this. It's a good one. Joining us now on the official Colts podcast, the defensive coordinator at UCLA, that would be Ikaika Molloy, and he, of course, is a huge father figure to Colts' first-round draft pick, Liatu Latu. And, Coach, thanks so much for your time. I know you're hard-pressed for it. You're still going through spring practices there on the West Coast. I just got to ask you, what were your first initial reactions to seeing not only Latu be drafted by the Colts with the 15th, 15th overall pick, but, in fact, he is the first defensive player off the board here in 2024? That was actually a proud parent moment. You know, I actually cried in the green room because not like like you mentioned, not just getting drafted, but getting drafted as the first defensive player off the board. Um, and it just, you know, in the green room, the mom and I were just talking about, we're reflecting back. We're talking about the recruitment of Layatu back at University of Washington. And we're kind of yeah. going through that story. And we talked about his journey and now we're here and he possibly could be, uh, drafted in the first round, and then that happened. I mean, that I was shocked for sure. Uh, I'm sure he wasn't. He he looked like he was ready to to go, no matter what what pick it was. But uh, that was definitely a, a blessing for him and his family. But it was a blessing for me as well, just being like I said, like a mentor towards him. I was a proud parent. Mm -hmm. Ikaka, I want to get into that that period at Washington uh, where you were you were there with Leatu, where he was medically retired. And he, yeah. something he mentioned in his press conference here in Indy was that you told him, hey, go, go do whatever you need to do to continue this dream of trying to play football. What do you remember about those days, uh, you know, how, how his mentality was, what his mindset was, and then the early days of him setting out to work at his craft, even though he didn't have a clear path to playing football ever again? Yeah, so at Washington, it was, it was tough because, you know, you're, you're talking to our 18-year-old, 19-year-old kid that was just told you can no longer do your dream uh, anymore, you know. And so that was – it was many days in the office of crying together. We're, we're kind of starting our own Bible study. I was at the time really trying to get him geared up to, um, to visit with the Seattle Fire Department because that was his next love when he actually retired from football. So I was trying to – at least give him a positive moving forward type game plan. Um, but he he was set on it. He was like, Coach, I, I am going to play again. Uh, he actually went so far to to prove he could play. He was playing rugby on the side. Yeah. So while we right. 
at right. University of Washington said he he's medically retired. Um, he was sending videos like, Coach, look, I can hit without pads. So, you know, just give me a shot. And then as the story goes, you know, I, I, I got let go at, at UCLA, I mean, at Washington and then joined UCLA. But myself, mom, and Lyle, were still searching the country for just one doctor, one doctor to give him a chance. You know, we went, we took him to Seahawks. They said no. Uh, there was a player from Georgia that had the exact same injury, went to the NFL. That particular doctor said no. And then come fast forward, there's a doctor in California that we found that said yes. So I immediately called Coach Kelly and I said, hey, do you mind checking with our team doctor to see if they would accept this clearance from Laiatu? Because I'm telling you, I think he would change the program. And so I gave Coach Kelly the name and Coach Kelly looked at me and said, are you sure? Like, you serious about this name? I said, I am. Why do you know him? And he said, that's our team doctor at UCLA. <laughs> and so right away, I called the parents and I, I, mean, I called the mom and I said, hey, I think we got a shot at this. We all cried on the phone. Coach Kelly called. We, we got him offered and and uh, set to come to UCLA and the rest was history. But like you mentioned, I mean, while I am trying to find a doctor to clear him, he was working out. Like when the players were not there, he was in the weight room. Like the, the mentality that that you guys have inherited in your, in your program, in your franchise, uh, I think it'll be really, really contagious because he, you know, his whole mantra is, is live like your last, L-Y-L, and he has it tattooed on him. Um, that's how he approaches the day. And, you know, I, I always tell this to people, imagine if somebody told you like, for sure, this was right. going to be your last day. Like, what is the mentality that you would approach that day? Well, Layatu does it every single day when he comes to work. He's always in that mode and is very contagious. But I think that's why he's not surprised at where he's at today. Uh, kind of a simple question. How did he get so good without playing football? He worked at it uh, off the field. So uh, in, we had meetings started at 7.15. The team meeting started, and there's like a 15-minute window between the team meeting and if it was off-season, off-season workouts, which he couldn't do. He ran to my office. You know, like, let's watch some film. He was studying for that moment that when he gets it, he's going to take advantage of. He's out in the workout. He cannot work out. So he stood next to the team, and he ran with them. Like everything he could possibly, we told him not to do, he did. You know, he can't lift. Well, he did it when nobody was around. He started doing yeah. light weights to, you know, so once he had that moment in his mind, he was prepared to conquer that moment as opposed to feel happy that he got to the moment. Coach, his his game, if we can talk about him on the field, his game is really refined. He's got a, a full variety of pass rush moves. I know you kind of already answered this to a degree, but how much of that is on him and his willingness to, to get better and the drive to work out on his own. How much is that on you and the growth that you saw, you know, within the defense at UCLA the last two years? Well, I think it's a little bold. Um, it's hard to take credit for, for how talented he is and what he's done, you know, the production he's created for himself. Um, on, on one end, you know, we would teach certain drills and certain aspects of how we're going to attack a person. And then he just took it to another extreme from film study to being on Saturday. And the thing I always tell fans is you guys got a chance to appreciate his pass rush in the fall. I had a chance to appreciate his pass rush in January during Saturdays. On Saturdays, he was out here on the field working his craft. Like he would visualize going against one guard to one tackle. And then when Coach Lynn was the coordinator here, he allowed us to create places and fronts that Layata could be against what we thought at the time might have been the, the mismatch against an offensive lineman, you know, so Lyle went from not just learning how to pass rush, but learning how to pass rush all the way across the board. And sometimes he was the zero technique or two eye or a three technique, not always on the outside. And because of it, he had to master different angles and different ways to get home. And he, he took that uh, very seriously. For, for Layatu to come off that, that stretch where he couldn't play football, and to have 10 and a half sacks that first year at UCLA. I know you saw that in him, but yeah. what was the reaction around the program when people were, were like, oh my God, like we, we got a player here. Like, well, How did that kind of go about as he started to make an impact at UCLA? Yeah, you can see the more sacks he started getting, the, the more the program was like, well, we, we might have a real deal here. And you know, all along he said, well, we thought we already had that at the University of Washington. So you guys are experiencing what we kind of knew. And he knew it as well. 
you know, so as he started developing to become what we thought was a pretty good pass rusher, then the scheme started changing so we can put him in better position that he's always having an, a, a chance to pass rush. And, you know, the, again, the, the, I got to credit him for the stuff that he has done in the off season to prepare in season and what we have enjoyed in the fall. That's something that he's mastered uh, over the months leading up to fall. I know you kind of touched on it in just reflecting on when he was drafted th- this moment, but where did where did the motivation for him come from to to keep going? And I, I mean, he was told you you're never going to play football again. A lot of people would have taken that at face value and said, "Okay, I'm done." But where did that motivation come from? And and just how impressive is it that he's now got to this point where he's a, the 15th overall pick in the NFL draft? Yeah, it, you know, really starting from his faith. You know, he truly believed. Uh, through God, God was going to put him in the right position to get to where he's going to go. Once he made that decision, he was going to play again, no matter what. His mom, uh, as a, as well as myself, we had to change our our view as well. Like we we were no longer trying to make him feel comfortable in the situation he was. If he wanted to push, then we had to be a part of it and really jump on his bandwagon and his train, as opposed to us trying to lead him. Uh, another direction and then from there like I said his mantra is LYL you know like your last you you can see there wasn't a minute of a day that he wouldn't try to get better you know there was I'm saying this now because he's no longer here so I I don't think I'll get in trouble but you know the weight room closed at times and he found a way in on the weekends and he you know we had to lock the elevators because he kept trying to find a way in on the on the uh, holidays we send the team home and his mom had to drive from Sacramento to visit her own son. He refused because at Sacramento, <laughs> he didn't have the weight room. He didn't have the football field. And, like, that was the mentality. People started to figure out, like, there is nothing that is going to stop this kid from doing what his dreams are set on. So, Coach, you're, you're telling me the Colts drafted a trespasser. That's great. That's <laughs> great. All right, here we go. Right? Th- thanks a lot, Coach. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Hey, let, man, you, <laughs> your, your, your time is so valuable. I know you got to run. So thank you so much. But last one from me. Can you talk yes. about his his relentlessness, his motor, his his hustle? How much of of his sack total, his tackle for loss total, his pressure total is just because this guy, like you said, just never quits. He does not stop. Yeah. I, you know, I think I'll use I want to say he, he used it in, in one of the podcasts or YouTube or whatever it is. But Max Crosby comes to mind. In the intensity he brings to the game, uh, the energy he brings, and just a nonstop, whether I'm getting blocked or not, I'm going to find it and will myself to the ball. That is a great comparison to what you guys have gotten in your franchise. Lyoto is a nonstop player, and he refuses to be stopped in order to get to the ball. Uh, in practice here, he's actually the one that kind of was the, the leader of it. No matter what we did in practice, when that last play was done, he yeah. would turn and sprint to the end zone. And the whole defense by the end of the season started sprinting with him. And for him, his whole mindset was the play won't stop until I get yeah. to the end zone somehow, some way. You know, and so I think that's something that you guys will see uh, over the course of the year. But also, you know, I call him the artist. I really believe he's changed. He will change the pass rush game like Aaron Donald did for the defensive tackle spot. I think he will change the game of pass rush in terms of how he does it. And, you know, just the, you know, like I call him the artist, just how detailed he's become in terms of making something uh, that could be very difficult look right. so easy. Well, Coach, I, I can't thank you enough for your time. Again, I know you're hard-pressed for, for everything going on there with practice still in full swing in the, in the spring on the West Coast. Congratulations to you. Yeah. I mean, honestly, congratulations to you and the role that you played in, in Liatu's life and his football journey to get him drafted by the Colts in the first round. Very kind of you guys, gentlemen. I appreciate that. And congratulations to the Colts franchise as well. I, I promise you, you guys got the best here. And he will he will add value to the franchise as well as from Coach Parcher. Take take his coaching too hard. He will do everything that you guys ask of him. Right. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you guys having me on. Fellas, nicely done, JJ. I mean, 
we're finding out a lot about this young man. It's not there's a lot, everything about him that you love, and yeah. I'm talking about just like seeing him as a football player, but everything off the football player, the joy, the family, everything, the luckiness. He feels like, wow, I'm actually in the NFL and everything. It's it's going to be a great story and a breath of fresh air around here. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you're just thinking about him and as a prospect, mm-hmm. like he's the best edge rusher in the draft. You know, you saw that clip of Chris Ballard going around where he said, you know, we just got the best effing edge rusher yeah. in the draft, and he's just laughing. The the reason why he was available at 15 is because of the the neck issue and the medical retirement. But once you learn the story of it, of, hey, he didn't agree with that, and the pandemic plays a part in it where he doesn't have a physical exam, uh, and, you know, it, it, it seemed kind of like he got a raw deal yeah. more so than— It makes than, you wonder, like, how, how that was even possible. Right, you know? yeah. How like, he even got here. More, more so than this is like a serious long-term issue. Yeah. And, I mean, some teams might just, you know, reflexively be scared off by that, which I think is fair. When How you're about picking universities, high, but, too? Can we throw that in there? Well, UCLA yeah. wasn't afraid of it. Well, I mean, well and so the, this, this is a wild connection that, you know, Coach Malloy got into about right. – the you know Doctor Doctor Robert Watkins and how he was the one who cleared him and then he goes to Chip Kelly and Chip Kelly's like you know that's our doctor yeah, who we refer to staff. so yeah. uh, just you know some serendipity included in it but <laughs> uh, I understand why teams would be scared off by it mm-hmm. but once you really dig into it I, if th- this does not seem like something that is going to crop back up again I mean he he said he was just going to go play rugby right like okay. That, it's a pretty physical sport, <laughs> yeah. but he was okay doing that. Yeah, that so why not you know, just There's keep a, going? Put the put the helmet and pads on. Those rugby videos that are out surfing. Oh, out it's on incredible. The line. Oh, my God. He shout out, shout out just, to oh, uh, Brent, Brent Hollerud and Meg Stahl on our social media team right for on. going and like finding those oh. huddle highlights of him playing rugby. That was just awesome. mowing ma- people I mean, down. I mean, goodness. ridiculous. <laughs> Oh, Mate, you're going to have fun calling this young man is what oh, we're no going to find out. I can't no wait doubt. to find out what happens in rookie minicamp coming up and obviously OTAs and then, you know, up at what happens at Westfield at training camp. But this is a great one, and we're excited. Everybody around here and in the city is excited for new blood, if you will, and new exciting players. None bigger than this second rounder. Mate, start with you out of Texas, a big receiver. Yeah. I know a conglomerate or a congregation or whatever of Colts front office staff and football operations went down to Texas, saw this man. Uh, Adonai Mitchell face to face saw Xavier Worthy as well down there. Uh, w- when that pick came up, and you know what this guy can bring to the table, and he was available where he was. Right, right. What was your first thought on that? And what I, he can do for this offense? My, my first thought is I can't believe he's still there. I can't believe the Colts are trading back and still being able to pick him up. So you know, great credit to Chris Ballard for the you know the the, the drafting gymnastics mm-hmm. with that, knowing not only you know, having the foresight to see, okay, he's in the cluster of the players we're okay to get in the second round, but also kind of knowing what the other team's radar might be around him within that pick. So uh, great that you're able to add two fifth round picks plus still get Adonai Mitchell. And, uh, you know, my, my second thought is that the guy's obviously a winner on the outside, which is what this, I think this draft was all about in terms of offense. You needed to address the playmaking ability and get more explosive outside the numbers to complement Anthony Richardson and certainly what you already have between the numbers with guys like Downs and Pittman uh, in those tight ends. So, um, you know, I just I, I kind of echo what, what Shane Steichen said after the draft and going back and watching more tape on him, he's exactly right. This guy's a winner. He's a clear separator at the top of his route. He's a big yep. play guy, right, averaged over 15 yards per catch, um, you know, at, at Texas last year. Uh, he's got – clutch ability. I mean, we saw all the touchdowns and those big moments in the college football playoff. I, I didn't realize until I looked it up that he's played in the college football playoffs every, every single year, yeah. year, you know, two at Georgia, you know, and then one at Texas. Can so I throw a quick stat in on there? Won a couple of national championships, too. I, I put this in uh, my 10 Colts things, but there's only one person in the history of the college football playoff who is more receiving touchdowns than Adonai Mitchell, who is five. It's okay. Devonta Smith, who had eight. Wow. But the, the leaderboard, I threw it in here. It's Devonta Smith, who has eight. Then A.D. Mitchell, Hunter Renfro. Remember at Clemson, yeah, he yeah. caught all those touchdowns. Yeah. They both had five. Then Justin Jefferson at LSU, he had four in one game. Okay. Uh, and then Calvin Ridley at Alabama. So pretty good list to be on there. Yeah, right. successful uh, list. Right all those there. guys, I mean, by the way, have had 1,000 yards in the NFL, had a 1,000-yard yeah. season. Right. So, I mean, obviously, I think the headliner of, of this pick is going to be the, the post-Friday press conference of Chris Ballard, you know, going on. On that little bit, of, he got a little excited. Obviously, talking about no, no, no. He got a little pissed off. He got a little pissed off. Yeah, there's no you know. doubt, right? 
Um, so I, you know, he, he fell. <laughs> he fell for whatever reason. But the Colts obviously have no hesitations in that in, in doing their homework. And you know, this is a first round draft pick that they get in the middle to late of the second round, and I think it addresses a huge need. And 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 we'll see how much production he can have outside the numbers, which the Colts I think desperately needed in this draft. So the the Colts last year were 29th in the NFL with 44 completions of 15 or more yards to wide receivers. Yeah. So they just they were not explosive as a wide and, and receiver. And how much unit. of that was the Minshew Well, effect, right. And right? I but yeah. but I think that the point here is that this isn't just AD Mitchell 100%. getting dropped into this offense. It's Anthony Richardson and AD Mitchell. Right. Um I think, you know, Alec Pierce is a guy who's going to benefit from Anthony Richardson being in there as mm-hmm. well. Um but if you're just looking to get more explosive as a wide receiver unit, right. A.D. Mitchell is not the only reason why you're going to do that, but he is a guy who should be expected to help with getting more explosive. And then, you know, you're talking about when you stretch the field with your wide receivers, that's a different calculus for opposing defenses who now maybe you've got to play more too high safeties. We can't keep that extra guy in the box that's, against the run. That's everything. And right that's there. everything right the, there. The box is everything for the running game with Taylor and Richardson. Right. Well, this is going to be interesting because I got four off the top of my head between Pittman, Downs, Pierce, and now Mitchell. There's going to be some uh, fun fights up in Westfield when it comes for roster spots in the wide receiver well, room. I just wanted to say, what what spells out there? How much play time is, it, is, is going to affect any veterans on this team or this rookie? Yeah. Well, Alec Pierce last year played 1,000 90 snaps on offense mm-hmm. he was he played the most snaps of any skill position player on the Colts I was at 95 percent of the team's snaps um I think A.D. Mitchell probably will compete to cut into that right um at the X but I also don't think you're just burying Alec Pierce with this pick it's not like the Colts went out and drafted Marvin Harrison Jr. who probably would have stepped in and just been you know the immediate right. starter there um you know I think A.D. Mitchell and Alec Pierce have a very healthy competition during training camp, and there are two guys who can be on the field. You know, you might not need A.D. Mitchell to play 50% of the snaps, yeah. which also then kind of eases him into his NFL career because you got a guy in Alec who you know can play, who can play on the outside. Um, and you also hope this is one of those things where competition brings out the best in both of those guys. Sure. Obviously, Alec did not have the season he wanted to have last year, but you know everything that we've heard about him is that his attitude was great through it, his mentality was great through it, and he's he's going to get right back to work now and going to compete to keep getting his snaps. More yeah. weapons for Anthony Richardson. Here, here. I'm all, I'm all in for it. Fellers, we're going to move down. Let's go a couple of picks right now in the third round and fourth round. Matt Gonsalves, uh, offensive lineman from Pitt and Wisconsin's Tanner Bordellini, which a lot of people saw uh, e- even in the past year as, wow, he was rocking such a great mullet. I'm sorry to start <laughs> with the mullet on this guy, no, no, but no, everybody you, you has. Seen. But I was watching in college games, and I'm like, dude, that dude is rocking that mullet, and he brings that to Indianapolis so with no, us. I, I I don't think anyone else caught this, but on Tanner Bordellini's media Zoom session he did right after he got picked, Mike Chappell goes finally, all right, let's see the mullet. Yeah. He turns around and shows it. And Lara Overton, her reaction to it. If you've ever seen the Simpsons clip where Ned Flanders is like squealing over purple <laughs> drapes in a house, it's just like, ah, like that. That's what Lara was doing. Like convulsing, she was she, so happy. She loved it on them. Okay. It was incredible. Great Love moment. what the kid looks like. I heard he shaved his head and then just <laughs> let it go. What? Love what he looked like. Okay, Tanner, we love what you look like. Now let's go. Where do these offensive linemen here start with Gonsalves, if you will? What he brings to this table and depth is everything yeah. in the NFL on the offensive line specifically. But five, a, five starters coming back, Matt. Well, that's that's exactly right. But you know, Chris Ballard is he, again. He mentioned that P word. Several times last Friday or the Friday before the draft, it's all about protection. You can't have enough quality depth pieces along that offensive line. The last couple of years, you, there, there's that clear investment with Freeland and now Gonzalez and then Bordellini. Um, Gonzalez, I think specifically, this is a guy that I think can play everywhere. He can even mm-hmm. play center, I mm-hmm. think. I think he's got the position flexibility or at least the body type they think that potentially can play in the interior, excuse me, interior, even though he played on the right side, mm-hmm. left side of the tackle positions in college predominantly. Um, to me, the, the most surprising thing about this pick, and maybe surprising is not the right word, probably more intriguing is that he only played three games last year. So there really is a forecast and a projection within this pick, and the Colts trade up in the third round to get him. And to your point, J.J., there's other – 
you know, draft pundits and experts that said this was a fourth or a fifth round draft pick. So all of that in mind, you know, kind of adds up to this really intriguing prospect the Colts have. Uh, but talking with the scouts afterwards and you hear Chris and Shane talk, this was one of their best offensive linemen mm-hmm. in the draft, yep. regardless of position. And I think position flexibility is a huge feather in his cap. And the Colts love guys like these. I mean, you go back to the the Joe Higgs and the Joe Wrights of the world. That's how you stay. That's that's your longevity piece in the NFL is your position flexibility. The more that you can do adds to your value. I don't think he's going to factor into the starting lineup next year, obviously. But Ryan Kelly is going to be a free agent. Will Fry is going to be a free agent after next year, 25. you got Braden Smith who's up. So – you, they're they're going to play this year. I'm just saying, I've well, talked my well, head. That, that's, that's, that's just the, the way it is the, in the, this the league. Rate, yeah. The injury right. rate is 100% along right. the offensive the, line. So he could factor in somewhere given how many different positions he can play. I mean, the, the Colts last year, Quentin Nelson and Will Fries didn't miss like any snaps. How about that? That's, that's, pretty, that, and, yeah, and that that's a testament to both yeah. of those guys. Right. But random stuff happens in a physical foot, you know, physical game. Yeah, a running back rolls up on you, you know, tears yeah, you know, up your you, ankle. You hope from that behind. doesn't happen. Right. You hope your starting five next year right. is the same starting five you had last year. But you know, last year Blake Freeland had to start what nine games and Wesley yeah. French on stepping in. Pretty solid. Right, on both you know? sides. I mean, yeah. So you're gonna need these guys. The thing with Gonzalez that I go back to, he was only ornery penalized. guy, right, JJ? Or, ornery guy, <laughs> little hey, little chippy, isn't yeah. he? Seems like a good fit for yeah. our offensive little, line room. Little foul language, yeah, little, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was celebratory. Only, he was only flagged four times in 1,757 snaps in college. Zero holding penalties. Oh, wow, that that's hard to do. Like with, with the way that holding gets called, to not even be in a position where you get called uh, as a tackle. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's, wow. that's that's pretty impressive. What were his uh, penalties? What, what just four false, false starts? starts? Yeah, yeah. okay. Which sometimes that can be on the quarterback, right. you know. Um, and then you know you throw in Bordellini. I I don't I don't totally love like playing favorites, but like this guy's one of my favorite picks the Colts had mm-hmm. in the entire NFL draft because like his he's just he he fits that mentality that you want out of the line the Colts line. You know he's the guy who's going to come in and learn. He's very humble. Understands his his versatility is important. But then you look at his athletic testing numbers, and like he broke Jason Kelsey's three cone record at the NFL Combine. So no uh, interior offensive lineman can move. Run, run the three cone faster than Jason Kelsey until Tanner Bordellini. He ran a four two eight short shuttle. That was the seventh fastest by an interior <laughs> offensive yeah. lineman. Uh, he ran a four nine four second forty yard dash. That's in the ninety seventh percentile. For interior lineman, he weighs over 300 pounds, and he ran the 40 in under five seconds. Hey, man. Look, and I know you can be like, well, what does this really mean? But, like, some sometimes when you get these great athletes at these positions, when they grow into it, when they figure out how to use their hands and how to set and all that, the, the creative stuff you can do with these guys is really fun to see. And we got a head coach here who does a lot of creative stuff with his offensive line. We saw it with Quentin Nelson mm-hmm. last year. Some of the stuff he would do on play action where he's pulling and he's just absorbing a Danico Autry bull rush. We saw it with Jason Kelsey, the stuff he was able to do in Philadelphia. Obviously, Quentin Nelson and Jason Kelsey are two elite top .001% players in the NFL. But I love taking the good athlete here and a guy who's versatile. And again, he's probably not a guy you're going to expect to start right away. But down the road, if you know, Ryan Kelly leaves in free agency. If Will Fries leaves in free agency, um, obviously you'd like to keep both those guys, but if something were to happen and you can't pay them or they go somewhere else and you can slide Bordellini or Gonzalez in, um, that's smart. And worst case, if these guys are just depth guys right. long-term, that's also smart because having good offensive linemen to come off the bench is a really important thing. Well, and, and they're here under contract mm-hmm. while Anthony Richardson grows sure. yes, to the point where – if these guys need to become starters in year three, year four, that's going to be a different roster construction dynamic when Richardson hopefully reaches that big pay. I always think of offensive line as like a weak link system. And, you know, usually if you have one of your starters go out, you're worried that the guy who comes in is going to be a weak link and they're just going to, that guy's going to get run at all day. Right. If these guys both pan out or one of these two guys pan out. You're hoping that that guy can come off the bench and not be a weak link. Good depth and a good part of this offense, too. And everybody's, you know, healthy across the board. We saw last year Braden Smith's coming back for a big one, so cannot wait. And real quick, would you rather be represented by the law firm or a restaurant? Probably the restaurant. You think so? Yeah. Just say it. See how it flows. Garce, yeah. see how it flows. Both, 
Gonsalves, sorry, Gonsalves yeah. and Bordellini's. Is that yeah. a law firm or is that a restaurant you want to go to? Um, I'm serious. Ooh, that's I good. want a, I want a table for two. At, yeah. on the patio at Bordellini's. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, they take reservations. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that. A little that. veal piccata. I don't want them. <laughs> Some chicken spaghetti at I don't, I don't want them representing yeah. me. I just want to eat at their restaurant. Yeah, Guys, yeah. I want them to cater the draft party. <laughs> well, those big fellas are coming in, and we're going to talk about probably down the road some uh, Italian <laughs> cooking with Bordellini somewhere. I'm I'm sure it's just going to come up. The, the only thing that's, that's a bummer about <laughs> Bordellini is that like so, Matt Gonzalez is from the New York area. If okay. Bordellini was from the New York area, that's just that's a home run. Right, right, for right. For home cooking, well, Italy, you know. Well, I, don't forget Anthony Gonzalez or um, a- Anthony Costanzo had the restaurant. Oregano, yeah. 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 So we're gonna try and let's just have Tanner Bordellini open a restaurant here in Indy. We'll move on. Let's move on with this offense as well. Going down here we go. Oregon State can't wait to talk about this young man, Matt Taylor. Really quick, what does Anthony Gould bring to the wide receiver room? And guys, I'm gonna ask you both, what does he bring to this new kickoff rule? Well, I think this is a great pick for the Colts and the foresight to understand that the rules are changing. I think there's different value now within these draft picks once you get to rounds four, five, and six. So I love this pick. This is probably my favorite pick of the draft because of the upside and the value that he can bring in a specialized role. That's what you're looking to do on day three of the draft. Mm -hmm. You're not drafting pro bowlers. You're not drafting – at least guys not right away anyways. right? You get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. You're you're drafting for traits. You're drafting for niche roles at least – early on. And for Gould, I freaking love this pick because of the new kickoff rules, because he's one of the best punt returners in the game in college football the last two years. And you're asking yourself, well, wait, wait a minute. You just said kickoff and, and punt. Well, the new kickoff is kind of like a punt mm-hmm. because yep. short area, guys are closer together. It's all about just vision and spacing and speed. And he's got all of that. So I love this pick from the special teams angle. He's on offense. He's mainly an outside guy. He can play in the slot too. That's but, interesting. But there. playing, yeah. but he he was mostly an outside pickup. You know, but he still was productive in a, in a major conference in the Pac-12. He had 1,300 yards career wise. You know, for the Beavers. So I, I I love this pick. I think good on Chris Ballard and obviously Brian Mason was a factor in it too. Just good on you to have the vision to say we're going to actually take a chance on a guy that could, you know, fill out a big-time role for us in terms of field position and giving us a spark in that third phase of the game. Well, right, write them down. That's five receivers think, in there. Uh, room. Well, well and, in but, and then Ashton Doolin's your sixth. Yeah, put him in pencil. Yeah, okay. yeah I, th- I think, you know, you still have to figure out how he looks on the new kickoff returns. Mm-hmm. It's not just, hey, this guy's going to be our kickoff returner. He's got to earn it, um, especially when you've got guys on this roster like Dallas Flowers who have experience doing it the other way. Um, right. But, you know, things could shake out where the Colts need Dallas Flowers to start games for them. Sure. And maybe you don't want a starting cornerback back there returning kicks. And maybe you, don't you want, want Josh Downs doing you, that. You're either. right, exactly. Right. Yeah. Where Gould is a guy who maybe he has a, a, a role on this offense, but it's probably going to be limited and targeted to certain kinds of plays. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, the, the, the kickoff, I think the expectation is that you're going to get, you're going to average probably about the 25, 30 yard line to start. If you can get beyond that because you have an ace back there. That is huge field position. And this guy at Oregon State, he averaged 16.8 yards per punt return over the last two so seasons. So he's moving. Good. So imagine, like, you're yeah. punting the ball, and he catches it at the 15-yard line. Mm-hmm. You're starting a drive at the 31-yard yeah, line. Yeah, that's, right. that's two first downs. Exactly. Yeah. Those you are know? huge yards that you're getting. Right. Uh, so e- e- even on punt returns, that could be a weapon for the mm-hmm. Colts here. Just that, mm-hmm. that extra 8, 9, 10 yards. Maybe you're not thinking he's going to house one every game or yeah. you know yeah. every, every season, but – those extra yards are critical totally. for starting off an and, offense in good position. And I see Shane Steichen doing this. Oh, yeah, you know that. Oh, yeah, you know jet what I mean? sweeps yeah. and yeah. You know, wide receiver yeah. screens. Just get the ball well, and right, quickly right. and you go. You mentioned the outside stuff. So he's 5'9", 174 pounds. Josh Downs is 5'9", 171 pounds. But Downs in college was almost exclusively a slot guy. 90% of his snaps came in the slot. Yeah. That's how we saw him primarily get used with the Colts. Gould, like you mentioned, Mate, is primarily an outside guy. So there, there could be a different, you know, and he could play inside too. I think 27% of his college snaps are in the slot. But he can be used in different ways. And I don't know if you're looking at him getting more than five, six snaps a game, but maybe on one of those he gets the ball in his hands and you see what happens. Yeah. Hey, speed kills, fellas. And, you know, that kid's got it when you're talking about 4-3. J.J., starting with you. This is your alma mater. Let's go to Missouri. Jalen Carlisle, fifth round, a developmental linebacker, 
uh, who contributes on special teams. Is he like a young EJ Speed yeah. type of guy if he makes his team? And I'm not being negative on that because right. in this NFL with this roster and 22 starters coming back, these guys got to come out and prove it. Yeah, I mean, you, you look at just the linebacker depth chart, and mm-hmm. Zaire Franklin and EJ Speed are firmly entrenched as your two starting linebackers because mm-hmm. you're in you're playing nickel so much. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's really you have two starting linebackers. Um, but he's going to have to compete with – you know, the guys behind them. So you're looking at Grant Stewart, who is an ace special teamer. Sure. Mm-hmm. Saguna Luby, who showed some stuff last year when he got on the field, also a good special teams guy, had the uh, blocked punt uh, against Tennessee. So, he, you know, he's got a bit of an uphill battle to make the roster, but a guy who, when, when Chris Ballard was talking about him, he mentioned EJ Speed a couple times. He's got long arms, mm-hmm. 34 and a quarter inch arms. Uh, he's, he's, you know, fast, he's big, he's athletic. And... Uh, I thought this was interesting that Tyler Hughes, the area scout who scouted Jalen Carlisle, brought up Divine Diablo, who uh, Gus Bradley, safety. Richard Smith had yeah. with the Raiders mm-hmm. in 2021. He was a safety at Virginia Tech. Yeah. They took him in the sixth round. He wound up starting a little bit for Gus and Richard in Las Vegas. Last year, he started for the Raiders. He had 104 tackles as a linebacker, so he grew into it. Yeah, right. And I think you envision hopefully the same thing with Jalen Carlisle, and that's kind of what the Colts have done at linebacker is they've taken swings on guys with length, which Carlisle has. There's no linebacker who's been drafted in the last two years who has longer arms than Jalen Carlisle. Huh. And you go and you, you take that trait, and you say, let's go develop you and yeah, figure it out right. while you contribute on Those special long teams. long arms will keep defend, you know, keep... Uh, well, right, because well, if you're 225 pounds the and you've away. got a 330-pound yeah. guard pulling toward you, yeah. you can still win leverage if you get your hands to strike him first. And at 34-inch arms, Carlisle is probably going to have longer arms than a lot of the guards who are going to pull to the second level to try to block him. Yeah, it's all about leverage and separation yeah. there. and that, That's a huge tool. Another piece of precedent to all this is Ronnie Harrison. Mm-hmm. You know, on the Colts roster last year, who went from safety to linebacker, then back to safety in a pinch towards the end of last season. But certainly a guy that can do it all, and he adds depth and value to several positions. I just think, sounds cliche, but this guy's just a stud. He's a football player. Sure. You know, just give him a, you know, Give him some pads and helmets and let him go. He's got a nose for the ball. And those guys will work their way and out. They the, always do. At Missouri, he's their leading tackler the yep. last two years, and he <laughs> plays safety, which means that he's kind of that hybrid guy. You know, whatever you want to call it, you know, the, the bandit or the robber. Look at him all proud down you there. Look at him smiling. That's yeah. my guy right there. My guy. Yeah. I said, Had a great got, game against Ohio State in the Cotton Bowl. You're, you're going to be just part – you're, you're going to have a chair right in front of his locker, catch-ups every day, what's going gonna, on. You know, talk about Brady Cook and, you know, <laughs> Coach Drink and all that. Uh, one other thing that I would be remiss to note here on Jalen Carlisle is the Colts' assistant linebackers coach was also a converted safety turned linebacker. Yeah, Kato, Kato June. June. He yeah, was a safety sure. coming out of Michigan. And That's right. We right. know here in Indy he was a pretty good player, so he got that experience too. Absolutely right. Can you guys name his head coach? Kato June? Yeah. Uh, Brady Hoke? No, that's too early. Um, oh, my yeah, God. It's like, what, 2002? It's on the tip of my tongue. Well, we going well, back here. You're a Michigan guy. You're just dying know. inside. You're Lloyd Carr. There it is. Lloyd Carr. Good pull right there. Okay, moving on here with this draft. No Michigan men drafted out of uh, – uh, drafted. No, rather. they went to a better better school and a better conference. That's true. That's true. No, mm-hmm. But, okay, <laughs> yeah. here I got I got to bring yeah. it back on. <laughs> because I almost started, but not yeah. start Overrated, the show with this, by but, the way. like, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. The cornerbacks. Can I get to the cornerbacks in this unit that's here and stuff? So young, obviously, health was an issue last year and stuff like this. But the cornerback in this defense and uh, the cornerback room in this defense and everything, and Chris Ballard saying, hey, I'm going up. Because, guys, I don't care who starts, but just tell me. Everyone and their brother on those mock drafts we talked mm-hmm. about earlier in the show had the Colts grabbing a cornerback at 15. There was a couple to choose from. Yeah, I mean, that. I think that's probably, for the average fan, the surprise of the draft mm-hmm. is that every mock draft you saw was Quinion Mitchell and Terry on Arnold or Kool-Aid McKinstry. Nate Wiggins. Yeah, I mean, yeah. all these guys were in play, and these were all first-round draft picks. And then the Colts decide to go pass rusher after they – I think tried very, very, you know, I think they were very, uh, they, they pursued trying to move up. Mm-hmm. They did. They tried to pursue yes. moving up. And then I think once those top three receivers went off the board, they had to reassess and a lot too false to them. And that's a premium position, a position of need. We talked all about that. Um, but not addressing the cornerback position specifically until what your seventh draft pick mm-hmm. and round number five on day three, I think took a lot of people off guard and, if it did surprise you, maybe you weren't listening as intently as you needed to be 
on Friday before the draft when Chris Ballard said, listen, I, it, this is kind of like the offensive line two years ago. These guys can play. They, they grew up. It's not as bad as y'all think. And I think the next step for Flowers and, and Brents and Jones – um, and, and obviously now Abraham in the mix as well. Simpson, if he can play some safety and cornerback, the next step is just trusting these guys more and press man to man. Right? How, how much more can you balance out the the lack of blitzing and the zone coverage numbers? Right? Because you're the you're the team that blitzed the fewest and the team that played the most zone. Mm-hmm. How much can you even out those numbers? by trusting the secondary that has two, three years under their belt now. Well, I guess in, in the case of Brents and Jones, it's only one. But towards the end of your rookie season, you're no longer treated like a rookie, right? You're, yeah. you, you've got baptism by fire at that point. So um, that's what I'm looking forward to, and there's that belief, there's that confidence that Chris Ballard and Shane Steichen have in this young secondary to the point where they didn't feel like they had to address it. They didn't have to you know, reach and, and show this – you know, tons of urgency to get a cornerback just because we're so young and so perceived and experienced in the back end. I I thought about that quote that Ballard said the Friday before the draft about the O-line and how he views the corners similarly. I was like, you know, coming into last year, we were wondering at this time, can Bernard Ryman play? Mm -hmm. We were wondering at this time, why didn't the Colts take a right guard? You know, someone to compete with Will Fries on the interior. And the Colts saw some stuff in both of those guys that led them to believe, hey, these can be our starters. I think it's similar with Juju Brents and Bernard Ryman are sort of similar in that role. Right. Like you saw the flashes. Wasn't consistent enough, but you saw the flashes in year one. And then Jalen Jones and Will Fries, both seventh round picks, right. who showed at times they could play as rookies or in you know their first real opportunity to start. And you go with that. When Chris Ballard said, we want to add competition to that room, I don't think that means we want to add a starter. I mean, do you want to add guys who are going to push Joe, uh, Jones and Brents? And by the way, Dallas Flowers is going to be someone who can do that already. Um, but I, I, it wasn't surprising to me. Like Chris Ballard even kind of laughed at the end of his press conference about uh, he was asked about Latu. And like, are you worried that he's, I think he's 22, 23. You're worried about the age a little bit. He goes, no, we tried to sign a 29-year-old defensive end. By the way, and Daniel Hunter. Yeah, yeah right, I mean, that was, right. that was Daniel Hunter. Yep. Colts are trying to pay him a lot of money in free agency to come here. They weren't trying to pay a cornerback a lot of money. They weren't trying to trade for a cornerback. That that was all BS, all that stuff. Really? So, okay. it, but th- they, that was not something the Colts were looking to do. Maybe you're look. Maybe if they, a high level upgrade was available in free agency, which wasn't the case. Maybe you would would have thought about maybe. it, but. Once there wasn't, it was like, okay, let's go ahead well, and let's see what these two guys have. And maybe the Colts still add someone there, but right. I'm not so hey, sure. Hey, that you got to keep playing path. high level football in Jalen Simpson from Auburn. But Micah Abraham, like the last two years, I mean, you know, he's got the most interceptions in the last two years in college football in the FCS. Right. FBS. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, FBS. What did FBS. I say? FCS. Yeah. FCS. Yeah. Different levels. It's yeah. a non power five, yeah. Marshall. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. that's that's the that's how you determine that. But I think yeah, Abraham comes in, and again, he's a six-round pick, and he's going to add some depth, and he's going to push for a roster spot, and you're not drafting him to be a starter right away. So I think, to be fair, like there there is this boat of confidence in this young secondary, especially when you don't address it until day three of the draft. So I do think it's a little bit of a gamble, right? But I think that we're going to see. Like, time is going to tell how this plays out, and – we're going to see just how convicted and rightfully so the Colts were into thinking that this secondary is ready to go. Um, but listen, we, we've seen these types of moves before in the past with belief in the young pass rushers that the Colts have had on their roster, the young wide receivers they've had on their roster. So there's no doubt that they feel a certain way. And I think the actions of the draft send a statement to how they feel about the secondary. There's a lot to like about that. Right. There is. There, there's a lot of potential, and there's a lot of upstart there. Um, but at the end of the day, I think fans get a little squeamish because of the youth and the inexperience. But, you know, devil's advocate to that is, well, how do you get experience? How do you get more playing right. time? How do yeah. you get better? It's you get, You're get you on the field more. So but that's, then again, that's yeah, you, you can't, you if, can't. if one of these two cats just dominates in Westfield, he's starting. And that's what I like uh, about Ju- competition. Juju Brintz. Juju Brintz is a bona fide starter right. if he can stay healthy. Yes, right. That, that's part of well, this picture. I think, I think I'm looking at these two picks as, yeah, they're going to compete mm-hmm. to start. Absolutely. But 
last year the Colts' depth at cornerback when Flowers went down for the year and then Brents mm-hmm. was out of the lineup for a while, it, it, they had some issues with depth. Jalen Jones stepped up and did a great job, but I think adding guys who have certain skills, Simpson's a guy who you know played safety in college, but the Colts think he can play corner, uh, outside corner in the NFL, and then Abraham, he can play inside and outside, but like you mentioned, Mate, those interceptions – and then, I don't know, I, I kind of like guys who have bloodlines. Right. His dad is yeah. Donnie Abraham, who led the NFL in interceptions in 1999. They're there, man. His cousin is Tim Jennings, okay. former Colts player. From Georgia, Who yeah. led the NFL in interceptions with the Bears in 2012. Nice. Interceptions just running run this family, I guess. I like that, bloodlines. Yeah, come on in here. We got room <laughs> for you. I love bloodlines in the NFL. Let's move on to a crowded room, guys. Finally, right here, Oklahoma. Jonah Laulu, seventh rounder. Does mm-hmm. he make the team? I mean, it's a tough, it's a crowded room. And obviously, uh, th- this pick, you know, is a, is a guy you look for in the future for help right now. Right? I would say that's yeah, accurate, right? I would say this is development pick. I mean, it's probably one of the most crowded rooms filled mm-hmm. with talent that you have, especially with the investment over the last two months with DeForest Buckner, sure. Grover Stewart, both in one in free agency, the other one getting a contract extension. Plus you bring in Raquan Davis, Taven Bryan is coming back. You got some position flexibility of other guys that can kick in and pass rush situations like Taekwon Lewis and Dio Adangbo. So yeah, this is probably a guy they're taking a flyer on because of the potential the traits that he has, the quickness, the speed, um, the power. This is a guy that just got better every year from Hawaii to Oklahoma. Like his, the totality of his career with the with the raw stats is not going to blow you away. But I think the film is better than the box score in this case. So yeah, I think this is a, a, a projection and somebody they they might try to stash on the practice squad and just get better and develop, and then we'll see where he is. Yeah. And you know, Anything outside years. of that, that's kind of what he is yeah. in your eyes? Yeah, I mean, Same. he had a 36-inch vertical at 292 pounds. That's pretty good. Athlete pretty good. then. Yeah. Pretty good athlete. Good so, athlete yeah, you, right bet, you bet on the athlete, and the Colts <laughs> thought he, uh, he when he moved to defensive tackle last year that his, his talent started to come out. But as I think we'll, we'll get into here in a little bit, defensive that defensive line room, yeah. there's going to be some – battles in training camp in that room. Oh, that I is can't a, wait. You're yeah, cutting that's room. You're, Competition you're, yeah, right. everywhere over this. And I love, by the way, Shane Steichen, when he talks to the draft choice after, I love watching the videos, obviously produced in-house. Our guy today behind the screen, behind the camera, one of those, always hear com- the word compete. Can't wait to have you come in here and compete, compete, compete. Yeah. Love the competition that this room or these rooms are going to be having for this football team led by Anthony Richardson. Okay, where else do we need help, guys? Real quick, anything happening before camp that we see a new face or two in here? Yeah, I think I think you might look at running back. Okay. As a spot, mm-hmm. um, you know, the Colts like Trey Sermon. They like Evan Hall. But, you know, they, they still kind of have that Zach Moss-sized hole mm-hmm. on the roster. Right. Um, that, you know, they, they did look at drafting a running back. Chris Ballard mentioned that. But, didn't you know, one didn't fall to them in the range that they were in. Yeah. Um, that could be somewhere where you look to address it. Maybe you still think about another safety coming in. Um, but really, those are, those are about the only two I kind of look yeah. at and say, yeah, these are spots where you could have guys come in and make the roster in significant roles. Yeah, yeah. We 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 forget that just because the draft's over, free agency's still going on. Yeah, and a lot of teams weigh and position themselves to see what their draft hall is, and then reevaluate. And, and, and the other free yeah. the the other little note here is that after the draft, un, uh, unrestricted free agents who sign no longer count against the compensatory pick formula. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking to play that game a little bit, um, some teams do wait until after the draft to go pick up a veteran. Uh, on the free agency gotcha. market. You know, like who, is, who is the Mike Adams of this? Yeah, Eric Fisher. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hey, yeah. there's going to be some great competition, which we talked about all through this podcast. What's your guys' favorite position group that's going to be going? JJ, you mentioned it off, sc- uh, off camera. You start first. That tight end room. Colts didn't do anything to the tight end room, tight and end room. but they did something to the wide receiver room. Yeah. So now if you're looking at this roster and you're, you're seeing – might be six receivers who yeah. you keep mm-hmm. uh, between Pittman, Downs, Pierce, Mitchell, Doolin. What does that going to mean? Make, Doolin's going to make the team as a special teamer. And then Gould, who would also probably make the team as a special teamer. Yeah. Does that mean your tight end spot shrink? Three? Three tight ends possibly three or four? with that? I, I think probably four tops, but more like but, three. But then you know. think about the guys who are in that competition. Right. Mo Alley cox Jelani Woods, Drew Ogletree, Will Mallory, yeah. and Kylan Granson. Mm-hmm. It's like one of those five might be out. Two of those five might be out. Yeah. And all th- all of those guys would be worthy of a roster spot. So that competition to me is going to be fascinating to see how that plays out. Because, again, 
if you're going to keep six receivers, someone else probably needs to fall off somewhere, and that's probably a tight end. Yeah. Mate, what do you think? Uh, no, competition, I, what, what, what department, as they say in the business world, will be competitive this, yeah. this training Shipping. camp? Shipping, <laughs> cogs, uh, you know. Logistics. Uh, yeah, accounts payable. No, I, I, I probably agree it's, it's tight end, and then on the defensive side of the ball, it's probably that, that defensive line mm-hmm. and, and just how much and, – and bigger picture is how much playing time or what is the playing time – how does that pie split up now with the addition of Latu with those edge rushers? Hey, man. Quiddy Pay, Samson Ebicom, well, Dino you made, Dengbo. You made two significant additions on the D-line in Layatu Latu and Jordan, and uh, Raquan Davis mm-hmm. on the interior. So those are two guys who are going to be on the roster. You can keep 10 or 11 defensive linemen, but you have a lot of guys who you have invested draft capital into. Right. You know, it, the, the Colts, every time Chris Ballard gets a chance to mention him, he mentions how much they like Isaiah Land, yeah. who's picked up off waivers last year. So uh, going to be a real interesting competition at, at that defensive line room during training camp. A lot more to come because those players are in the back right now getting ready for this season, and obviously we're going to have that long gap in, in that July area, and then it is on. Can't wait. Hey, uh, I just want to say this. Coming up, uh, you guys – cover this draft and this team better than most. Lair Overton as well is right up there. But I love breaking down the draft, and I thank you because you make us smarter, and I think you guys would agree with that, of breaking down this specific draft class with these two guys, J.J. Stankovitz, Matt Taylor, voice of the Colts, at J.J. Stankovitz, at Mayte Colts right there. Uh, just thank you. Thank you for doing that because there's going to be so many storylines that are coming up here. Uh, we're going to promote inside football. Coach Rick Venturi will be breaking down the draft on Thursday on the Colts Audio Network. Fellas, this was a little bit of a longer one, but I'm glad we did what we did because we got the tools and the cutlery out and we cut and dissected <laughs> and everything like that. Yeah. Almost like uh, almost like the meat that you provided for everybody on draft night. Yeah. You brought in some sewage, I saw. Yeah, Jeff. <laughs> What's so it called? Every, uh, it's Portillo's, buddy. <laughs> every year, every year, Dave Knickerbocker, uh, our VP of content and production here, he, order, he orders harsh, Portillo's <laughs> during the draft. I know, and Jeffrey a, takes a, a photo of one of the beef sandwiches and sends it to me with yeah. just the caption, and sewage. I, and, I know. and I'll end with this. And I still ate two of them. I know, I'll end with this. I took a picture of it, and I go, and I swear, I'm, I'm, I'm coming clean. I go, boy, if I put a little mustard on that, it really doesn't look that bad. But I just, oh, it got well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait just wait saying. Yeah, you got to put anyway, the Jardinera on it. Guys, thanks so much for the help. Again, at Mayte Colts, at JJ Stankovitz. Colts.com, the voice of the Colts right here. I'm Jeffrey Gorman. Going to be back with more. Keeping you up to date on this football team. Excitement is everywhere, man, because it is almost upon us. This team led by Anthony Richardson and a couple exciting uh, draft. Uh, the whole draft class is exciting, but boy, those one and two guys, I can't yeah, wait to watch them go. work. Ooh, for JJ and Matt, I'm Jeffrey Gorman. We'll talk to you next week.